Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and Chuck's here too, and so is Jerry, and this is Stuff You Should Know. I don't have a shirt on. (laughs) That's cool. I don't have pants on. (laughs) I probably should have told you that before we got going, but, or not at all. That is uh, definitely <laughs> the the state that we're in these days. It's totally fine that you're not wearing a shirt while we're recording. I went to put one on, and then I was like, why? <laughs> That's a great question <laughs> to ask yourself every morning, really. Uh, by the way, uh, we should point out, I just noticed, I don't even think I told you this, but I noticed today I got, um, I have always have a, a, a Google search setting for stuff you should know when that pops up. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And it popped up that our board game is for sale oh, on nice. Amazon.com. Again, finally. It came back <laughs> in, huh? I guess so, and it's on sale, so it's like 20% off even. If anyone wants it, uh, we should point out, I looked at the negative reviews. This is not Trivial Pursuit. This is a completely different Stuff You Should Know game mm-hmm. that Trivial Pursuit loved and wanted to co-brand. Uh, so as far as the one-star reviews that say... This doesn't work with my Trivial Pursuit board. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried Just to mash to them together. <laughs> <laughs> but it's out there, again, I think, if people are interested uh, in that. Yeah. Hopefully they are. I didn't realize that was a plug until about halfway through. You were still thinking, <laughs> me without I a th- shirt. Thought there was some story. <laughs> I thought there was some story coming out of it, and then I was like, oh, I see where he's going with this. No, I, just, I noticed that this morning, so I thought I'd mention, uh, before we get into... Uh, what will admittedly be a bit of a freewheeling discussion. I think on uh, Alien First Contact, this one didn't quite fit into our what we like to do, which is sort of a tighter beginning, middle, end type of thing. Mm-hmm. So I think this will be a little more freewheeling. And yeah, I'm fine with that. It's actually super appropriate because that's basically the same insouciant attitude that humanity has shown toward the possibility of having to communicate with aliens thus far. Yeah, well, maybe free that's wheeling. Why. You know, yeah. it's just kind of like, uh, yeah, we'll figure that out on the fly after it happens, kind of thing. And that's really, I mean, in, to, in in some ways, it's like, well, yeah, I mean, why would we waste any time figuring out what we're going to say to aliens if we're not even certain that aliens exist? But in another way, if you look at it, you can say, like, that is extraordinarily irresponsible. And, like, really, how much time and resource and money would it take to say, hey, you group of humans who are into this, can you go figure out what we should do and what we should say, some contingency plans, just in case, just in case. Um, So, I mean, it kind of just depends on your perspective, I think. But there are people out there, Chuck, who are working on this. They're just not really receiving any government funding, and they may or may not be being listened to by governments around the world. But there are people who have us covered to an extent. Yeah, that's a good preamble. Thank you. Uh, I think, I guess, you know, the first thing we should talk about, briefly at least, are the couple of ways that this could go down. Uh, uh, One of them is far less interesting than the other, Mm -hmm. which is to say, If we find evidence of primitive life, let's say, let's say the Mars rover uh, finds and and there has been some promising evidence of life on Mars. But Mm -hmm. if we find like a mold or some weird, you know, virus or just microbes or anything on Mars, not super exciting, uh, but they still have to sort of prepare how they would handle that. And they have talked about that kind of thing, and they basically have said that if that happened, there would be like a joint press conference and all the scientists would be involved, and then they would start studying that stuff. I I think the real money and sort of the fun of this discussion comes when we talk about intelligent life. Right. Because, you know, that's that's the money topic. Is something more like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. No, definitely. But there, a little more on, on discovering primitive life. What you just described with that press conference, that already happened back in 1996 with the ALH 84001 meteorite that turned out to be a chunk of four and a half billion year old um, Mars, basically, that had broken <laughs> off at some point and landed in Antarctica. And there is multiple 
um, circumstantial evidence on this rock that suggests that a magnetic microbe inhabited this rock at some point. That maybe within, you know, four and a half billion years ago, there was microbial life on Mars and we have evidence of it. There's a lot of people out there who are, are you know, very well versed on this who say it's still not proof of life. There's, it's still all just circumstantial evidence that, yeah, put together is pretty convincing, but it's not convincing enough to say, yes, there's life out there. But it's still up for debate even all these years later. So that, that press conference with the scientists who discovered it with skeptics who present the opposite side, like that has actually been put into practice before. But yes, I agree with you. Um, finding the, the um, like intelligent life elsewhere, what are um, commonly referred to as extraterrestrial intelligences or ETIs, which sounds way smarter than just saying the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> Those <laughs> are, sure that is, that, that's the money contact for sure. Right. And, you know, within that becomes a whole host of, uh, issues, and we're going to just kind of talk about all those because there are a lot of things at play here. You know, one is like we have no idea what that could look like. We have no idea if, you know, and we'll talk, you know, all throughout this about different ways we might try and communicate or pick up communication from them. But we have no idea if that would even be possible or if they even have brains like we do that could process any kind of communication like we do. So there's just a lot of speculation when it comes to stuff like this. Uh, and I I think that some of it probably has been informed by the movies a little bit, right? Yeah, I think it ac- absolutely has been informed by not just movies, but like the science fiction um, genre of like books. And uh, rom-coms. For sure. <laughs> a little bit of definitely maybe in there. <laughs> Um, but but yes, but the the reason why is because science fiction writers have like a really long upstanding history of making fairly accurate predictions or figuring out, um, you know, paradoxes, uh, weird solutions to issues that that, you know, normal scientists aren't necessarily thinking about. And they've contributed to the field. So it makes sense that we would kind of lean on science fiction to come up with some of these or let it influence us, too. Yeah, and, you know, there are a lot of smart people thinking about this stuff. Uh, there's a gentleman named Jacob uh, Hawk Mizra who works at Penn State University, go mm-hmm. Nittany Lions, mm-hmm. uh, and is an astronomer there and said basically, and this is in an interview with Live Science, said, you know, what we would probably do if we did spot some sort of intelligent life is we would probably or we should probably slow our roll and just sort of watch them for a while from a distance, try and gather information, learn as much as we can, and then maybe at some point, before we even send humans, send out like a robot or something. Right. So what he's talking about— Our bears best a, robot. <laughs> right. What he's talking about bears a really strong resemblance to a military document from the 50s that no one has a copy of but has been written of um, by people who supposedly— have read it before back in the day. It's called Seven Steps to Contact. And it was basically that plan. You know, we we find something, we sit and observe it from a distance, we get a little closer. There is a a procedure where we abduct uh, a member of that species or whatever, if we can, to like learn what we can from them. (laughs) Then we announce our presence and then we try to communicate, right? And um, communicating using uh, like a, a probe Um, or some sort of, like, computer makes a lot of sense. But it leads us to a really important kind of rule of thumb in this, this, um, this field. And that is that if we humans have come up with it, there's a really good chance that an advanced civilization that we will come in contact with it has actually done it already. So if we've decided that a space probe is probably the best way to contact people, that's probably what we should be looking for because that's probably what they will actually do. Yeah, and this is where, you know, it's sort of a it's sort of a heady thing to think about, but it, the idea is that they would be an advanced like way more advanced civilization than we are. Mm-hmm. It's sort of an assumption that if they contact us or if we can make contact with them that they're way far ahead of us in technology and that they have actually survived uh, beyond where we are now, which is uh, technical 
or technological uh, adolescence. I mean, it seems like we've done a lot, but, you know, Livia points out that we've only been communicating, you know, via radio, via radio for like a hundred years. Right. So like we're super, super young. So the idea is that who, if there is something out there, they're way more advanced. They've survived beyond that. They have technology that is, uh, they have advanced that did not end up killing them. So they survived what's called the great filter, mm -hmm. uh, which we're not even, I don't even know how you know better than I am. How close are we to approaching that? Um, the predictions are within the next hundred years. If we can survive okay. the next hundred years, we might be okay. Of like advancing tech to the point where tech then takes over and wipes us out. Yeah. So if we can survive that, the great filter, um, that means that we'll have such a mastery of technology that we can defend ourselves from extinction in any form, natural, self-imposed, whatever. We'll just we'll have a, such a mastery of technology that it can't wipe us out and we can't be wiped out. And so the lifespan of the of humans could go on for billions of years. So if we detect an advanced civilization, what they tell us, Chuck, is that it's possible to make it through the Great Filter because we don't know if that's the case or not. All the evidence we have is that we're the only intelligent life in the universe. So that, that, that raises the question, is, are we the only intelligent life in the universe? Because all other intelligent right. life has destroyed itself as it's tried to go through the Great Filter. <laughs> right. And if so, does that mean we're about to destroy ourselves because right. we're about to go through the Great Filter? Or, or is there never any? Or was it already in the past? Was it was right. there some other stage in evolution that oh, we've sure. already gone through? And so right. if we come in contact with an advanced civilization, they show us that the, the great filter is probably behind us and we have a long, happy, uh, technologically advanced life ahead of us for our species. Right. Uh, we should probably break, but before we do, uh, I do want to mention that that same Jacob Hawk Mizra also points out kind of the obvious, but we do need to mention it, that they may are like this whole idea that we could be out there watching them potentially. Mm -hmm. They may already be out there watching us. Right. And we just don't know about it. And then we would be in a reactive mode rather than a proactive mode. And it's just something to think about. We're not like trying to say aliens, man, but uh, just because we don't know it's out there yet doesn't mean that they don't know that we're out there. No, and it's again, it's probably not aliens if we're being observed. It's probably right. a, a probe of some sort. And the the spot du jour that people are suggesting where it would be hiding out is in a co-orbital uh, asteroid out in the asteroid belt um, that has the same orbit as Earth around the sun but doesn't orbit Earth. Um, and that would provide a really great um, hidden spot to to check out Earth and, and kind of keep tabs on us. Because who would be crazy enough to fly their spaceship into an asteroid field? Well, what's it, what's really exciting is, like, we'll probably be mining asteroids in, like, the next yeah. 20, 30, 50 years. So, so if out. that's the case, we would find that probe. And possibly Han Solo. <laughs> that's right. Super uh, <laughs> old Han Solo with a single diamond earring for some reason. Right. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's take that break, and we will come back and uh, talk about a topic that we previously covered, uh, SETI, right after this. All right. Uh, we have a whole episode on SETI, uh, mm -hmm. the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Was that one at Comic-Con? No, because we well, did a UFO it? one at Comic-Con. Oh, okay. I think that's the one you're thinking of. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Those are always fun. I sure. enjoyed those. Definitely. The Comic-Cons, that is. <laughs> right. Uh, they, they were always fun because we had a mix of like stuff you should know listeners, but also sort of arms crossed Nerds. <laughs> it entertained me. <laughs> yeah, that ended up liking what we did, generally. Yeah, so I just have to say now, anytime I hear Comic-Con, have you seen Love on the Spectrum US, the new uh, season of Love on the Spectrum? I never saw the old edition. Oh, you got to see or it. Or the new one. So there's a new one, and there's one um, one uh, regular person. Um, I, I, I want to say character, but it's like, you know, real life. Sure. So there's one person on it. Her name's Danny, and she's like super into animation. And 
is just laser focused on finding a partner who is equally into animation as she is, which is really tough because she's really into uh-huh. it. But um, one of her first questions uh, in, in any one of the dates she goes on is, have you heard of Comic-Con or do you feel <laughs> you would ever want to go to Comic-Con or something similar to that? That's it's really nice. it's super cute. I think you can say cast member. I think that still covers reality. Oh, it does? Okay, yes. Yeah. So one of the cast members named Danny. Yeah. Um, All right. So SETI, uh, like I said, search for extraterrestrial intelligence. You can listen to that full episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, There is a a body, a key body for SETI uh, called the International Academy of I'm sorry, Astronautics. And they are non-governmental and they were founded in 1960. And what they try to do is bring together experts from all over the world. Uh, for, I think there are 77 member countries at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is UN recognized, so it's not just you know a bunch of crackpots out there <laughs> right. talking about aliens. Yeah, and they helped uh, establish some protocols in the late 80s, and then updated them in 2010. Um, just sort of some guidelines about how to handle it if SETI did find something. Yeah, and they're really kind of basic and. In- boring even when you stop and think you're talking about discovering and searching for extraterrestrial intelligence. But it's it's good that they did this. They provided a baseline so that if you're a scientist working in this field, you know, oh, I can speak to the press or, oh, I haven't I haven't really confirmed this discovery, so I shouldn't announce it yet. Like there's just really basic guidelines that I think if you are in the grip of having discovered something like this, it would be really helpful to be able to refer to them, I think. Yeah, and I think what's promising about these guidelines is they talk a lot about being honest and open with the press, like you said, and working together with people from all – scientists from all over the world and forming task groups and not jumping the gun. And like if you – you know, in the movies, if you get a – you know, the computer screen pops up an alien signal. Mm-hmm. Like the first thing you do is type back an answer. Like they say, no, 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 don't type back any answer. Uh, <laughs> you are not the guy in the chair. Right. Uh, what we need to do is like take our time with this stuff and consult everybody, including the UN, on like best next steps. Right. The the guy in the chair who's big, sweaty, bearded, and has a really affectionate relationship with the heroine who's actually interested in the male lead. Yeah, you just described me right now, except that guy has on a shirt. <laughs> right. <laughs> so you've got what? You've got searching. Uh, you do it transparently. You're supposed to communicate with the public. And as we'll see, um, that's, you know, if you think about it, if you pay any kind of attention to science journalism, there's all sorts of discussion and talk about searching the stars for extraterrestrial intelligence these days. And that is part of this 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 protocol. Like, keep the public informed. Tell them everything you're doing. Tell them what you're finding. And then later on, as we'll see, tell them how excited they should be about that. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess we should talk about that. They actually have a scale that they've developed to gauge how excited the general public would be Mm -hmm. about finding something out. And it's called the Rio scale. uh, And it was um, proposed by astronomers Ivan Almar of Hungary and Jill Tarter of the United States in 2000. And it's kind of funny. It, it's based off the, or at least modeled on the Torino scale, which is a scale of like uh, the effects of an asteroid hitting the earth. But it's how excited would the, the public be? And what's funny about it, it's a zero to 10. And one of the examples that Livia gives is, all right, let's say they found a like a pretty foolproof report Mm -hmm. that they found of a signal from intelligent or potentially intelligent life, but they found it in the archives. Like, Hey, we dug this up from 2002 Mm -hmm. and it's confirmed. And it was a signal of alien life trying to speak to us. Mm -hmm. It, that ranks a two out of 10. (laughs) Right. It's a, and and two is, um, is nominally low importance. I just think that's so telling of people in there. Like, having to be so in the moment. Like, when did this happen? Oh, okay, yawn. Right, right. So so it's not just like how excited the public will be. It's also how excited you should tell the public to be, like how important the right. finding this is, right? So right. you would turn around, and it's still, it, it strikes me as really weird too, that, hey, we found a, a beacon that we've confirmed is from an intelligent life outside of our galaxy, but it's not that important. <laughs> That's yeah, <I> weird. Mean, <laughs> 
the wow signal wasn't the whatevs signal. <laughs> nice. Like they were excited about it. They included an exclamation point. Right. Uh, I should point out though that same signal. If they found that like right now tomorrow, um, yeah. they said that would rank a seven out of ten. So yeah. it would be newsier, I guess. Right. So seven is high importance, and then ten is oh my gosh, oh man, oh geez. Yeah. That's that level of importance. Yeah, b- uh, well, which is potentially like panic level, right? It is because basically you've got a um, – ba- you essentially have contact is, is what a 10 would be or a signal that is coming to us from our solar system that we can like study. It's, it's all about how credible and reliable it is. And the first Rio scale that was um, introduced in 2000, I think you said – um, that was updated here or there, I think, in 2003. And then in 2018, I believe, there was uh, a an update to it, so, so much so that they call it Rio 2.0. It was led by Duncan Forgan of the Center for Exoplanet Science at the University of St. Andrew in Scotland. Go Scotland. Go uh, golfers, I'm sure, is the University of St. Andrew mascot. Sure. Um, and so he and company updated the Rio scale to make it even more robust. And again, it all comes down to how credible is this information, right? Like how, how credible is this discovery? Can we study it? Um, what do other scientists in the field think about it? And you put right. all this together and then you say, actually, this is low importance. This is high importance. This is as important as it comes. And then you tell the public we found something and the importance of it is as important as it comes or it's not uh, yeah. that important which would be a 10 which is she dances on the sand <laughs> i don't know what that means but i like the sound of it chuck all right should i point it out or should i let you just discover it later or never at all i think or maybe someone will email and tell point, you no point it out i hate it when people email to tell me <laughs> stuff that i missed it was a dad joke an 80s uh kid of the 80s dad joke okay all right i'm getting nothing? warmer nothing? still nothing no <laughs> i've got maybe um uh mr mister no you're close it's the rio scale she dances on the sand oh, would be the highest yeah level. that yeah. is great i can't believe i missed is it? that <laughs> all right it was great it's a great song oh okay bad so joke, any reference great to song. it is, is by proxy great <laughs> should we talk about seta yeah, just one more thing before we pass on from the Rio scale. Like okay. one of the important things is the reason why the scale is so varied from like l- low importance to she dances on the sand importance. Oh, yeah. Is um you're supposed to communicate this to the public. If if it's low importance that doesn't mean don't bother. It means go tell the public we found this, but it's actually not that big of a deal. It's it's it, instructing astronomers how to present this to the public, you know, how excited you should tell them to be, how important right. it is. Yeah. And then also before we go on to SETA, it, once you actually have a detection, there's that SETI permanent committee from the IAA. They have protocols for, for when you do actually confirm you have detected an alien signal or presence somehow. Right. So it's all sort of set up. Yeah. And so if they're, if they're broadcasting on the electromagnetic band which we are out there looking for, um, so hopefully that's what they're using, um, that band would be protected. Everybody else would get kicked off of that band, and then that band would be studied as intensively as an electromagnetic band has ever been studied in the history of humanity. I love that. And then lastly, Chuck, um, there's a there's a protocol not to respond. You, again, you're the guy in the chair, like you said. You don't get to respond. But so neither do the astronomers, neither do like the IAA. Like it's meant to become a, a international global discussion on how humanity should reply to this. And that's based on the idea that how we reply is going to have a really big impact on how the conversation goes um, from that point on. Well, yeah, because what we don't know and one of the things that uh, I think would be the most pins and needles sort of thing to find out mm-hmm. is whether these ETIs are uh, what they call selfish or whether they're universalists. So are they mm-hmm. here to help us and say, you know, we have all this great technology, then we can help you out. By the way, we have a cure for cancer. You might be looking for that. Sure. Or are they uh, – well, I guess that would be the universalist, or right. are they selfish and are they here to conquer us? And there was a researcher that you dug up that pointed out something kind of key, which is 
sure, we wonder if they're selfish or universalist, but I don't know if anyone's noticed, everything we talk about is how it benefits or uh, is bad for us. So we are definitely on the selfish side because <laughs> right. n- nobody at all is talking about how we might be able to possibly help them. Right. And it sounds pretty goofy and childish to say like, you know, oh, they want to conquer us or whatever. But there's actually like legitimate reasons an alien intelligence would want to conquer us. They might want our resources to exploit for their own uses. That's mm-hmm. a big deal. We um, love corn. They may also basically have a, a their own protocol where anytime they, they meet intelligent life, they snuff it out because they don't want any potential future rivals to come along. And it's not worth their while to investigate that life further to see if it ever would be a rival. So they just wipe it out wherever they encounter it. So, yes, it sounds childish at first, but when you start to think about it, it becomes a little eye-popping because they there there are universal you would ex, you would expect universal reasons for them to harm us uh, and they're predicated on the idea that natural selection is a universal phenomenon that right. that that all life or more to the point no life just comes fully formed into being out of nowhere it progresses from other forms of life and develops along the way and so you can it makes sense that it would it would happen elsewhere in the universe and if that's the case then yeah you could make a really good case um, that there are that there are destructive intelligences out there that um, just wipe out competition and rivalry or rivals or yeah the other option too though is that's hanging out there is they may have initially been uh, uh, selfless or universalist or benevolent and then they either, accidentally infect us somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, we've seen that if you look to our own past of when, you know, conquering colonialists invaded foreign lands and brought their disease with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a far stretch to think that could happen, you know, on an interplanetary or I guess, uh, well, sure, interplanetary level. Mm -hmm. Uh, Or that doesn't happen and they come here and they want to help us out, but then they study us for a while and hang out and they're like, you people are awful. (laughs) Either they undermine us some way by accident or on purpose, or then they decide to wipe us out. Right, because they they place a higher value on, you know, life in general. And they're like, these guys are actually a threat to life in general. So maybe if they're utilitarians, it would make sense for them to eliminate us to save more life, you know? Right. Um, Because, again, like if you're – let's say we actually did encounter an advanced civilization, their perspective is much different than ours. We have no idea how long humans will be around. And, frankly, those of us living today in the 21st century probably have a – a a shorter idea of what the human lifespan is than people in the past did, right? So they're coming at it like these guys might be around forever and might who knows how technologically advanced they could become. So they could see it as like beneficial to the greater good by getting rid of us now. Like like going back and strangling Hitler in his crib when he was a baby or something like that. (laughs) That would be their opportunity to do that because we would be utterly defenseless against a civilization that was so advanced it could come visit us or even send probes. But baby Hitler is the human race. Exactly, in this case, which is really sad, but yeah. Right. Let's just move on to Seta, (laughs) which we were going to do minutes ago, but I told you this would be freewheeling, everybody. It it was so freewheeling, I have one other thing. (laughs) Do you really? Go ahead. I have two other things, actually. So there's – we actually have – legitimate reason to believe that that they wouldn't be a conquering type because, number one, they're very long-lived. That's our assumption, right? Okay. And if they're very long-lived, they're probably a cooperative society because non-cooperative societies fight amongst themselves and can end up wiping themselves out. They're much likelier to. So if we encounter an advanced civilization that is very, very long-lived, has been around for millions or billions of years as a species, um, they probably are super peaceful because they learned along the way and maybe even evolved along the way to cooperate. So it would be more likely that they would be those universalists that we met. Okay. And then there's one other um, example of life here on Earth where there was, like, positive contact, not necessarily between societies, but between an encoded version of a society and a new society. And that was when the Spanish Moors of the 12th century discovered lost Greek knowledge and 
they turned around and introduced it to Europe, and it brought Europe out of the medieval or dark ages into the Renaissance. It was triggered just by this knowledge that had been lost. So you can imagine that if we were suddenly bestowed with a tremendous amount of new knowledge, who knows where we could go with it? Well, yeah, and that brings up a point, which is um, if we're talking about what might happen if a super advanced civilization got in touch with us and you want to do that brain experiment, one way to sort of go about that might be to look back at our past and say, well, what's happened in the history of humanity when the equivalent of that has happened, which is like, let's say, uh, a more ad like advanced, and it might as well have been aliens uh, contacting humans, mm -hmm. but a much more advanced European nation, like going into a, a primitive tribe in, you know, deep in the Amazon. And the answer isn't pretty if you don't know anything about world history. <laughs> yeah. So if, if you want to look to the past of how humans have uh, kind of operated when they're the advanced civilization, mm. maybe a little humility going forward and what might happen to us is in order, you know? Right, for sure. And we'll talk about societal impacts, but that really kind of um, sheds a little light on that, foreshadows it at least, that like whether we wanted to feel humble or not, we probably would if we encountered an advanced civilization. All right. I think we beat around the bush so far that we can actually take a break <laughs> okay. and then talk about Seta. Seta, poor Seta is just sitting out there. It's a fun bush to beat, though, isn't it? <laughs> it, it really is. I like this kind of stuff. Good. All right. We'll be right back with Seta, I promise. <laughs> Okay, Chuck, um, Seda. I got a few more points to make. <laughs> <laughs> so if SETI is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETA is the search for extraterrestrial artifacts. Because, again, there's a lot of people out there who say the best way to explore the universe is through machines that we deploy and then send back information and maybe are so advanced that they can actually serve as ambassadors for the civilization. Right. So not only maybe that should be our way forward for us, but with SETA, it's a search for extraterrestrial artifacts is maybe we should also really, really keep an eye out, not just because typically we've been listening mm -hmm. for things. And yeah. they said maybe we should also be looking for evidence of a probe. Um, as far as us doing it, they, there's are some benefits. One is uh, that maybe it would uh, the, they wouldn't know where we're coming from. Like we're not literally sending out a beacon from where we are just in case they are dangerous. Sure. Uh, so if they found our probe, unless it was stamped made in the USA, which it probably would be. <laughs> with a map to get yeah, with to the, the USA. <laughs> Dallas, Texas. <laughs> uh, that They wouldn't know where we are. So there is potential benefit there. But um, I think SETA is interesting, the idea that we should be looking for – stuff out there, maybe in those asteroid fields. Yeah, so back in the mid-'80s, a couple of SETI researchers, Robert Fridas Jr. and Francisco Valdez, or Valdez, um, they basically said there's we can conceive of three different classes of artifacts that you could, that, that like a, an intelligence, an extraterrestrial intelligence might send out. Um, and they weren't talking about like, you know, this this kind of von Neumann probe or something like that. They were saying like, it, as far as detection goes, it would be put into, into three categories. The first one is ones that actively seek out other intelligences. Mm -hmm. The second one is ones that avoid detection. And then mm -hmm. the third one are ones where the, the extraterrestrial intelligence is indifferent to whether we find it or not. And after examining it, they said we should be looking exclusively for class three artifacts because class one, um, we would have detected already because they would have come and found us if they were right. seeking attention. And then class two, we're never going to find because this is an advanced civilization. So we would just uh, guess that they they would be able to keep us from knowing that, that yeah. we were being watched. Yeah, like maybe they have just, you know, figured out invisibility, something as basic as that. Sure, yeah. So we should look for the ones where they're like, who cares if they find this old space junk? Right. And that's actually what um, Uamuamua uh, is thought to be by at least one astronomer. You know about that? Excuse you? <laughs> 
<laughs> Uamuamua, was that the guy uh, that's working on the Galileo project now, Loeb? Yeah, Avi Loeb. All right, well, yeah, to talk about Uamua, then we'll talk to about the Galileo project, I think. Okay, so Uamuamua um, means, I think, like, visitor. Um, and it was found in 2017. We're not quite sure what it is. It's probably a hunk of a planet, but the one thing everybody agrees on, it's not from our solar system. It's from another star system because it doesn't move like anything in our star system does. Um, but it supposedly has been observed uh, exhibiting um, uh, gravitational acceleration, non-gravitational acceleration, meaning it's accelerating faster than gravity uh, would would suggest it would on its own, right? Which means like it might be propelled by something. Which is crazy to think about. And that Avi Loeb we were talking about uh, is a Harvard astronomer and came out and was one of the only people that came out and says, you know, straight up, I think this is alien technology. Mm -hmm. And so Avi Loeb is who launched the Galileo project in 2021, which is the only sort of active set of thing that we have going right now. And right now, they are. Uh, there was the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Report last year from the U.S. Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that's basically, I mean, they were meeting about that even just recently. You know, the government, the U.S. government, that is, is finally saying, like, all right, we don't need to be, like, uh, embarrassed about talking about this stuff. There yeah. are things that we've seen that we can't identify. They are unidentified flying objects that like our military has seen, like our best pilots are reporting about. So we should start talking about this. And part of that was this report, the un unidentified aerial phenomenon mm -hmm. report. And the Galileo project is sort of combing through that also has some telescopes going now watching for objects. Uh, I'm not sure like how vast that is at this point, but it's just, launched a year ago, so I'm sure they're getting going. Yeah, and we should say Avi Loeb is viewed um, alternatively as a genius or a maverick or a rogue or a crackpot, right. but he does have, you know, legitimate bona fides. He's not one of those guys who's like, you know, um, he, he, he parks his camper on the campus of Harvard, so he's right. a Harvard astronomer. <laughs> like, he's a legitimate, he was the head of the astronomy department for quite a while, I believe. Yeah. So, um, yeah, he thinks from what I read that Oumuamua is a billions of year old defunct alien probe that mm -hmm. no longer works or operates and just happened to stumble into our solar system for us to find accidentally. I seen, what does it look like? Have you, I didn't even look it up. I should have. It looks like a kind of cigar shaped. Um, it's apparently between 300 and 3000 feet long um, and 115 and 548 um, feet thick. Uh, and, I'm looking at it now. You were generous with the cigar. It looks like a joint. Okay. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah, it looks like a spliff. It does. Um, so yeah, it looks like an alien spliff is, is probably what it is. Maybe they're sending us a message. I've never used the word spliff before in my <laughs> life until just now. Yeah, I don't say that word either. No. no it's way no, too no hip for us, I think. Oh, is that hip? It didn't used to be. Oh, I don't know. I think it was, uh, I think it was European maybe at first. Right. Didn't used to be. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we, we are so uncool. I have no idea. <laughs> so, Chuck, if we run into somebody or somebody finds us or we just detect life and are, figure out a way to communicate with it, um, we're going to immediately hit a wall. Yeah. Because... The idea that we'll be able to communicate with an extraterrestrial intelligence presumes a lot of factors and variables that would have to be in place that may or may not. And if you take one or two of them out, we're totally uh, up the creek as far as communicating goes. Yeah, that's why I always loved Close Encounters of the Third Kind, because mm -hmm. even as a kid, I remember thinking how cool it was that they didn't just like hold up a sign that said, hey, how are you? <laughs> And that they used... Want a spliff? This, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that they used, you know, the do-do-do-do-do and the mm -hmm. lights. I just, I thought that was kind of cool because that mm -hmm. is, you know, we don't know if they even have the same senses that we have right. as far as hearing something or seeing something. Uh, there was, a, there is a book 
uh, that someone uh, put out, a German mathematician named Hans Freudenthal uh, called Linkos, L-I-N-C-O-S, colon, Design of a Language for Cosmic Intercourse. And by that, he means (laughs) speaking to one another, I think. Uh Uh, and this, it's kind of funny, Libby included a quote from uh, an astrophysicist that said, it's the most boring book I've ever read. <laughs> Logarithm tables are cool compared to it. <laughs> uh, and it sounds like it's not anything you'd want to read, but it is, uh, Linkos is this radio wave language mm-hmm. that this guy came up with that basically conveys symbols from math and science, from Latin, uh, symbolic logic. And it starts very fundamental and then gets a, like these are numbers and they're conveyed to you through pulses. And then it gets a little more advanced as, as it goes. Uh, not to say that Linkos is like everyone's like, oh, we should just use Linkos. Mm-hmm. But it is to say that very, very smart people have thought about like how do we even think about think about communicating with these things. So from what I can tell – like you could use Linkos, it would be something that we could try to use. Yeah, it'd be uh, a start. it's that it's like that established, you know. And um, that book actually kicked off a field um, of study that's still around today, and I think just kind of getting going called xenolinguistics, which is basically the idea of how do you speak to a culture that you you don't share anything in common with. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, because if we talk to an extraterrestrial intelligence, it'll be unlike talking to anything that we've ever tried to talk to before, including non-human animals. Because non-human animals have shared a lot of the same experiences that we have here on Earth. I saw it pointed out um, in one paper, humans share 50% of our DNA with a carrot, right? Mm -hmm. These intelligences, we would have... Basically nothing in common with, no shared experiences. <laughs> right. And, and like you said, we might not even have the same senses. And so when you start to see, like, what's stacked up against us, like, what if they don't communicate using their eyes or their mouths or sound, uh, and they you, they use magnets instead or magnetism? Right. We would it would be totally lost on us. We might not even sense it in any way, shape, or form. And even if we did, we wouldn't know how to put it into a, whatever thought they were trying to convey. Yeah, I mean, there are very smart people. Uh, There's a gentleman named John Billingham, uh, who is a leader in that field, and a a social psychologist named Roger Haynes, who have worked a lot with uh, historians and scientists and psychologists about how to do this and the repercussions. But there are people like Billingham that have said, hey, this is likely impossible. Like, we should think about these scenarios, but we should all prepare ourselves for the fact that we just may not be able to communicate with them at all, ever. Right. And even if we do, um, we would be communicating with them on intergalactic distances, yeah. which is Carl Sagan put out, like, even if, we're, if we communicate with somebody 50 light years away, which is pretty close considering how big the universe is, um, our conversations uh, back and forth would still take 100 Earth years. So not only would we have to gather everybody together to come up to some consensus on what we're going to say, uh-huh. we would have to keep that that consensus and that level of coordination and cooperation going over multiple generations just to have one back and forth. Yeah, like people are working on this and they know that their great granddaughter is going to follow through on it. Yeah. Or the, ho- the hope is that they will. Right. Which is kind of cool if you think about it. It is something that could really bring humanity together. It could also be just another thing that divides us further. Because, I mean, we when's the last time we came to a global consensus on anything, you know? Have we oh, ever? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is an interesting thought experiment, though, to think about. And these are the things that these groups of people – that John Billingham and Roger Haynes get together and they talk about this stuff is to explore the idea of like, is there like one of some of the first things that we should want to find out is, is there a universal set of ethics or mm-hmm. morals? Mm-hmm. Do they believe in something like a God like we do? Um, did they evolve at all? Are they, uh, do they only look at things as like predators and prey? Like, are we screwed to begin with? Mm-hmm. Um, would they mirror us at all? So it's all really, really heady and interesting, I think. And I, I just think it's cool that people are out there thinking of this stuff. 
Yeah, and and there are people thinking of it for sure, but um, probably not enough. And in 2020, a group of researchers got together led by Catherine Denning and Stephen Dick, um, and they created a white paper that was signed by NASA researchers, SETI members, other experts um, who basically said, hey, we need to be throwing a lot more funding at it. We need to be doing a lot more research. And this is important. And they, they cited the World Economic Forum back in 2010. Every year, the World Economic Forum puts out a global risks paper. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, they included a list of X factors, which are possibilities in the not too distant future that could happen to humanity that we just couldn't possibly predict for, especially because we're not doing anything to try to predict. Uh, And one of those X factors was um, being contacted or discovering life off of Earth. Yeah, I would say that's pretty high on the list. Do you know the other ones? Yeah, uh, runaway climate change. Of course. Co- um, uh, profound cognitive enhancement. You're like, I have them tattooed on my forearm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what in, else? In elfish. <laughs> <laughs> um, rogue geoengineering projects. That, yeah. that could be a problem because there's actually like rich people thinking about doing stuff like that. Uh, and then the cost of living longer, which I th- I found fascinating. But it's oh, true. Yeah. Like we can barely support humans through age 80 now, socially speaking, how are we going to support people if that that life expectancy doubles in the next like 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Yeah. It's a good question. Hey, I got to say, if uh, you're probably um, too shy to plug your own show, but if this kind of stuff interests you guys, you should definitely, if you haven't already listened to The End of the World with Josh Clark, your 10 part series, 10, right? Yeah, 10. Thank you. Uh, it's great and it's very, uh, heady and smart and thought provoking. So, um, I'm plugging it. That is very nice. Thank you, Chuck. I appreciate sure. it. It lives on. It'll, it's still there. It is. It's still there to, to go be listened to if you want yeah. to listen to it for free, wherever you get podcasts. It's, it's not old news. It's free. Yeah. No, it's definitely still out there because the world hasn't ended yet. That's what I always say. Somebody should jump on that and do a limited series documentary on it. I've talked to a couple of people about it, and it just hasn't ever quite worked or worked out. So it's it's still I'm still open to the idea for sure. Well, that just goes to show how hard it is to get any TV project off the ground, which we know. <laughs> it really is. But if anyone out there is do, does that kind of stuff, you should get in touch with Josh and do Man, it. Man, Chuck, I owe you a fiver at least for this. Well, just don't quit the show if that happens, and we're all good. I definitely won't. This this okay. is where my heart is, man. Good. Work-wise. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> didn't have to point that out, but sure. <laughs> you got, well, I didn't want everybody to think I was like a total weirdo loser, you know? <laughs> right. He loves work like that? Jeez. Yeah, usually home is where the heart is, Josh. Right. You got your priorities mixed up. You got anything else? Nothing else. All right, everybody. Well, since Chuck said nothing else and plugged the end of the world with Josh Clark quite nicely, uh, that means it's time for listener mail. That's right. Uh, And there's nothing like a nice, intelligent, heady discussion um, followed by uh, pedantic, you said the wrong words, email. (laughs) So this is a this is a nice guy, though. I like Danny. Uh, Hey, guys, longtime listener. He was very squeamish about even mentioning these things. Mm hmm. Uh, I'm a long-time listener. I love everything you guys do, and I hate that I'm giving in to pedantry, but (laughs) the amazing Free Press episode was all I could take. Uh, Naturally, with that topic, uh, I believe Chuck said people's voices were being squashed. Mm -hmm. I hate to say it, Chuck. The word is quashed. (laughs) And the reason I hate to say it is that squashed is a much more fun word to say. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably still say squashed because I just like saying it. Uh, You're not off the hook, though, either, my friend. Uh, While I'm on it, so sorry, I have to get it off my chest that it bugs me when Josh says to look up contemporary articles about a topic, uh, meaning from the topic's time period. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing insight, but the word he's looking for is contemporaneous. Uh, Contemporary will always mean articles from right now. Uh, contemporaneous means from the same time as that topic. <laughs> Can't you see Danny like at his computer <laughs> and his hands are shaking because he's using all his yeah. might to stop himself? But he's like, "Can't I know. resist <laughs> correcting?" I think that was the deal. Uh, he says, "Please don't roast me for being a pedant. You guys are a true inspiration." Uh, I wouldn't say anything about it if I thought it would offend you and know how graceful you are about such things. So Danny really set us up where we had. <laughs> he to be. really did. Please be nice. 
Yeah, good email, Danny. Thanks for sending that in. It was. And Danny, if I start using contemporaneous in reference to uh, articles from a certain time, it's because of you. That's right. And we, as evidence that we didn't squash your voice, <laughs> uh, we are open to criticism. That's very good, Chuck. Uh, if you want to be like Danny, just don't. Just send us an email about something else. You can wrap it up, spank it on the bottom, and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.